Terror in the Mountains Sightings of the Sasquatch creature persist from the heights of the Sierra Nevada mountains to the depths of the Mojave Desert. Many speculate on the nature of these high desert reports, believing them to be Sasquatch that are traveling from the mountains of LA to the Southern Sierras. Matt Moneymaker leads a team of researchers into the icy heights of the Sierras, following old reports that may hold new discoveries. Welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Eli Watson. In the last episode, I teased that I would be going out with Matt Moneymaker and investigating the Southern Sierras where there have been some howls heard back in the 1940s. And before I get into that, I wanna discuss the idea of possible migration routes used by the Sasquatch here in Southern California. As I discussed in the last episode, Southern California is extremely developed and they've basically built up all the valleys and everything all the way up to the mountains where it's more difficult to build. So that leaves us with the biggest wildlife areas here in Southern California being the mountaintops. So if I had to describe and explain the terrain in Southern California with respect to Bigfoots, I would describe it to other Bigfooters as a whole bunch of sky islands. And we say sky islands for terrain like kind of west of the Rockies, where you're surrounded by big, lower elevation, dry areas with no forest. And then you have these mountain ranges protruding up basically out of deserts, creating this high alpine territory that has a lot of animals. And Southern California is like, there's a contiguous chain of fairly high mountains coming into low foothills and back into high mountains again from which things like bear and deer and bigfoots and mountain lions can traverse and stay in trees and in pine and maybe have to come down into oak but bend back up into pines again and so those are the two different environments the mountain ones and then the desert ones people are much more familiar with the desert ones because there's more roads through it and there's a better visibility to it and there isn't as nearly as much recreation going on in the mountains because there's only a few highways that go up there. And if people go up in the mountains, usually it's to go skiing. And closer to LA, a lot of hiking is done, but there's, let's just say, a lot more land out there than there is people wanting to go out to it. And even if they want to go out to it, the trails and places they take only penetrate in, especially when you're talking Southern Sierras, the trails only penetrate in part way. So there's vast areas where there's no people because there's no trail, except for the occasional real adventurers that are gonna go, like, go back in horseback in places where there's no roads or no trails for whatever reason. So those are the areas where we think the Bigfoots are probably around. Again, and that's deducing it from the pattern of reports and plotting it on the map, figuring out, you know, uh, where they are at, at certain times of year. One of the things I hear most often is that Sasquatch tends to stay in the same spots for a long period of time. While that might be true in places like the Pacific Northwest or Northern California, where water and food is much more plentiful and you don't have to move as far to find it, I don't know if that's true here in Southern California. I've been filming these series of episodes in the spring and in the winter, so everything looks alive and vibrant this is the period of the year where we have the most moisture but in the summers when it gets up to 100 degrees everything dries up and there is no water deer bear and everything will move from mountain range to mountain range in search of food and water i think sasquatch might be the same if you look at a map of southern california you'll see the mountains form a sort of chain you have Palomar Mountain, 
that leads into the kind of Anza area that leads up into San Jacinto. From San Jacinto, you have the San Gorgonio Pass, which leads into the San Bernardinos. Across the San Bernardinos, you have what's called the Cajon Pass, which leads up into the San Gabriels. And then further north, which you could still sit in Southern California, up in the, to the Chihachapis and the Ventura County Mountains, and then the Southern Sierra. You'll find that these mountain ranges are all connected, only separated by small passes. Places like the Tejon Pass, the Tehachapi Pass, these are all small junctures that animals will use to cross to get from one mountain range to the next without having to cross large distances through highly developed areas of Southern California. For example, near the San Gorgonio Pass, which is in between the San Bernardinos and the San Jacintos, you have Joshua Tree. While Joshua Tree isn't exactly located in the pass, it is close to the pass, and it is close to the San Bernardino Mountains. Black bears have been seen in Joshua Tree. While it's not common for bears to travel that far out of the mountain ranges, I think if a bear could survive in Joshua Tree, something like a Sasquatch possibly could as well. And if you look at all the reports of Bigfoot in Southern California, the mountaintops are the hot spots, which makes sense. It's usually cooler in the mountains, there's more water in the mountains than in the low-lying deserts. But if I'm suggesting that Sasquatch is using these deserts or these passes to get from mountain range to mountain range, then I would expect to find sightings in the desert, in which there are. People wonder how could Sasquatches get to Southern California, into the mountains there? Well, the answer is simple. Um, there is an unbroken mountain chain that goes from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way down to like Angeles Crest, San Gabriel Mountains, all that stuff, through the mountains of Tehachapi. And also, people don't think of Sasquatches as desert animals. However, I have personally done two footprint investigations in the Mojave Riverbed, both of which were in December and January, if I remember correctly. Those riverbeds do offer pretty quick um, transverse, I guess, between the mountains, a quick way to get to certain areas if you want to get into them. And nobody's really going down there at night. It's five or eight, 10, 15 miles. That's easily, easily traveled by a Sasquatch overnight, those areas should be looked at because there's evidence that has been found there before. For years, we have heard about sightings in the middle of the desert. It doesn't happen now very often. It happened more in the past. But I guess the way to describe it is, it's almost like you could say, here's a map of the PCT. So this is the coast of California and California extends inland about that far. And this line is the Pacific Crest Trail. So it shows how it comes up from San Diego, San Gagonio, San Bernardino, San Gabriels, and then gets up in the Tachapis, and it keeps going north into, into um, uh, the Southern Sierra, uh, and basically is on the east flank of the mountain range. The desert sightings, I think, they're coming out of these mountains, they're wanting to go down here in a hurry, and they're just making a beeline across the desert, and people are seeing them when that happens. They're just trying to make time getting here as quickly as possible, because it would take a lot longer if you follow the trail up and down Hill and Dale all over here. The desert is the beeline if you're gonna go that way. And I'm sure they can do that because they definitely do that in New Mexico. And a lot of reports are actually near creeks or streams, you know, bodies of water which I think is quite obvious. Even with the reports that were out of the deserts throughout the 70s and 80s, like the backside of Big Bear in the Mojave Desert and you're into Lancaster and Palmdale, which is right behind Angeles. I don't think they lived in the desert. I think they were just moving down there maybe for a few days, the right time of year. I don't think it would be in the summer heat, obviously, but I don't think they were living there. I think anywhere they were spotted in the deserts, you were near um, elevated elevation areas near the mountains where it could get up pretty fast, probably in one day. That's what I'm thinking. In a report submitted to the BFRO, there was a report from 1979 in Desert Hot Springs, which is 
close to Joshua Tree and close to the San Gorgonio Pass. According to the report, the witness was leaving their driveway and was looking out across the road. Standing in the desert just off the road was a tan-colored bipedal creature. They flashed their headlights at it thinking it might be someone, and it took a few steps back. According to the witness, it filled them with fear. They were overcome with anxiety and panic, and they decided to just stay home. They said, I did not speak with anyone about it right away because whoever heard of a desert Bigfoot but later found out that all the locals call him Yucca Man. Yucca Man seems to be a pretty common name that I've heard come up across several different sightings in the kind of Mojave Desert area. Perhaps the most famous Yucca Man report comes from 1971 on the Bigfoot Encounters website. This sighting occurred at 29 Palms, which is a military base off in the far eastern side of the Mojave Desert just north of Joshua Tree and places like that. The person who submitted this report was the spouse of the Marine who was in charge of the armory at 29 Palms. So one morning while out on patrol, the Marine found one of the night guards on the ground, nearly incoherent, with his rifle bent almost in half. After calming the night guard down, he asked what had happened. And supposedly, as the night guard told it, he was walking around the perimeter and heard something walking in the desert. He raised his rifle and told it to stop. Whatever it was came out of the darkness, grabbing his rifle, bending it nearly in two, and scaring him before it ran back off into the darkness. Now this woman who submitted the report also mentioned some other vague reports she had heard from around the 29 Palms area, but as well as Joshua Tree. I'm having a hard time verifying that these events actually occurred. So naturally, one would kind of consider those sightings up near 29 Palms as kind of a fluke, perhaps a hoaxer or something. That is, if they were the only sightings to come out of the Mojave Desert. If you recall from the last episode, the California Bigfoot organization, led by Rich Grumley and Floyd Smith, operated out of the Palmdale-Lancaster area which is also known as the Antelope Valley. The Antelope Valley itself is on the western tip of the Mojave Desert. There isn't a whole lot out there in terms of what you would consider Sasquatch environment. It's mostly shrubs, there's not a whole lot of trees. I mean, it really is a desert. However, the Antelope Valley is surrounded by mountains. The San Gabriels form the southern border. And then you have the Tehachapis to the north and to the west. To the east, it opens up into the Mojave. I found an article from the Lancaster Daily Gazette from 1973 that mentioned the California Bigfoot organization and Rich Grumley as they followed up reports in the Antelope Valley. According to this newspaper article, there was as many as 20 reports, including finding tracks in the Sycamore Flat campground. Also located in the Mojave Desert is Edwards Air Force Base, which is where a lot of experimental aircraft are tested. There are some UFO reports from there, so I will be returning back to Edwards Air Force Base in a later episode to discuss those. But most interestingly comes reports of Bigfoot way out there in the middle of the Mojave. On the Bigfoot Encounters website, Doug Trapp, who, if you remember, is a friend of Daniel Perez and found those footprints back in Hemet in the early 1970s, interviewed three people from Edwards Air Force Base under the agreement that they would remain anonymous. The first was a lieutenant who was in charge of the security sector near Rogers Dry Lake. He supervised surveillance activity from 1972 to 1975. One night, one of his guards reported a perimeter breach by a tall man who wasn't really a man. Confused by this statement, the lieutenant drove down to where that guard was and asked him more details, to where the guard responded basically with the same answer. The lieutenant decided to scan the area and spotted this tall man about 500 yards away. 
Supposedly, it looked like this ape man was scanning the ground looking for something. A helicopter flew overhead, which spooked this creature, and it caused it to run and hide behind some rocks. And then later, it ran away. When the lieutenant reported this to his higher-ups the next morning, they told him that they had seen these creatures and were aware of their presence. They told him not to interfere with them because they were trying to ascertain more information about these creatures. According to the lieutenant, in the following years, they saw these creatures on several occasions and, as per their orders, did not disturb them and did not harm them. They just let them go. But as far as them learning more about these creatures, he didn't know anything about that. Doug Trapp also interviewed a major from Edwards Air Force Base who told him that there are tunnels that go underneath the Air Force Base. The official usage of these tunnels is classified, but he did tell them that on several occasions they had seen these creatures wandering into and out of the tunnels and that there were surveillance cameras in these tunnels that had recorded them on multiple occasions. The last interview was with a self-titled security grunt who had reported that he had seen these creatures on multiple occasions, including seeing family groups moving throughout the Mojave. He also told Trapp that they were mostly nocturnal. I don't really know what to make of these sightings. I don't think Doug Trapp is making them up. Obviously, if we could get access to some of the recorded video footage of these creatures, that would go a long way to proving that not only are these creatures out there, but they're traveling through the Mojave Desert. But for now, it's just more anecdotal evidence that these creatures can move across deserts. I also want to note that most of these sightings occurred in the 1970s, before the big house boom of the 1980s. Since places like the Antelope Valley have been developed, there are less sightings, if not no sightings, in those areas anymore. To me, that doesn't indicate that they're not here in Southern California, it just means that they're being more selective with their route. The mountain ranges are virtually unbroken, separated only by these small pass areas. A place like the Antelope Valley is the smallest portion of the Mojave Desert to cross. You could traverse from the San Gabriels to the Tehachapis, dipping down into the desert for one, two days maximum. And if Sasquatch is an animal, it does what most animals do, which is seeks the path of least resistance. However, now with it being so developed, any animal is going to avoid walking through a suburban neighborhood, so they might consider an alternate route from the San Gabriels into the Angeles National Forest through the Tehachapis that way. So to me, what it looks like is that we've just cut off one of their passageways. However, I don't want to solely focus on Bigfoot sightings in the desert. The main talking point here is a migration pattern if they're going through the mountains. Therefore, I'm more interested in sightings in the pass areas, the small areas that separate the mountain ranges. Obviously, you have the Yucca Man reports from the Joshua Tree, 29 Palms, Desert Springs area, which is near the San Gorgonio Pass. And if you're following the mountain chain upward, that would lead you to the Cajon Pass next. One of the highlights of the Cajon Pass is an area known as the Mormon Rocks. It's basically a huge rock formation that's jutting out of the ground. I was on a dirt bike camping trip in the Cajon Pass on the road that goes up towards Wrightwood. And there's a place called Mormon Rocks. We were parked in that area riding our dirt bikes around, so we're staying in an RV. I think I was 14 or 15 years old. I don't remember the exact year. I'd say 84 to 86. Um, we woke up in the morning and my friend's dad said, someone was walking around the camper last night. And we're like, what? We're like, what are you talking about? He's like, someone was messing around in the, around the camper last night. And we're like, okay. He's like, stay in here. I'm gonna go outside. It was early, it was like 6.30 in the morning. He's like, I'm gonna go out there and see what I see. 
So he went out there and he said, this is really odd. The guy was barefoot. And we're like, what? Barefoot? What is going on? I'm like, is there some kind of wild, loose hippie out here? What's going on? And that's it. That's, that's all I remember. I, of course, we didn't follow up anything. We're there for dirt biking and I'm a teenager. I don't care. Todd's story there matches a lot of Sasquatch behavior that we've examined here in Southern California. It was a nocturnal event. The Cajon Pass itself opens up into the Mojave Desert, which further adds to the theory of Sasquatch being seen in the desert. They don't live there, but they just pass through. Also located near the Cajon Pass is Lytle Creek, which, as I mentioned in the previous episode, was famous for its Fontana Speedway monster. So sightings in and around the Cajon Pass have been documented. But this is where it gets exciting because after the release of the last episode, Daniel Perez and I were contacted by a man who claimed to have found footprints in March of 2020. This man is an independent contractor who took a job for the Forest Service repairing a Forest Service road. And when this happened in like March of 2020? Yes, and, and I didn't just see one, I saw there was, but that one was more distinct than the one down here because it's hard pack. And then you could see where it had made its way up through there. Look at that, that is a footprint, not a bear print, not a cat print. That is a footprint. Now look at that, look how big that Compared to my foot. Look at that. Big f***ing huge. And, and when you, you were here in March of 2020, what were you doing up here? Did you see that that crossing and that wall? Yeah. We were, we had finished that. I would drive through here after we had finished that wall and I would take this commute home instead of taking the freeway. Okay. You know how, the freeway gets bad. I don't know if the, the Cajon Pass gets terrible every day. And I started using this as a, my commuter road. Nobody really knows this road's here. Right. And it had been closed for three, almost three years. And there was very, and still to this day, I think there's very little use on this road. Originally, he told us that the footprints he found were near Lytle Creek, which is true. But to my surprise, these footprints overlooked the Cajon Pass. Now, March of 2020 is the most recent report that I know of. And if you remember, March 2020 was the beginning of the pandemic. There was less traffic on the Cajon Pass than normal. But I've also been informed that there are wildlife pathways underneath the Cajon Pass, allowing deer and bear and whatever to move through the area. But that is exactly what I'm looking for. Evidence that Sasquatch uses these pass areas to traverse from one mountain range to the next. I saw that and I was like, what the hell is that, you know? And uh, like I said, I, I've been hunting for years and I've never seen anything like that. Anything. Right. So the next path, if the Sasquatch are following these mountain ranges, would be the Tejon Pass, which connects the Tehachapis and the San Amigdio Mountains. And unsurprisingly, there are reports from that area as well. For example, in 1993, two men were driving along Highway 183, which is near Gorman. It was about 10 p.m. and both witnesses said that they saw a roughly seven foot tall creature running in the desert off of the highway headed south. Both of them said that they were frightened by what they had seen. Then in 2004, a land surveyor was working near the Tejon Ranch, more closer to Fraser Park, and was traveling along an old Ridgeline Road. He saw what he thought at first was a, just kind of this black shape that he thought might be a tree trunk of some kind until it moved, in which he thought it might be a bear. 
but realized it was running on two legs and was far too tall and far too skinny to be a bear. He observed this for about 12 seconds before it disappeared finally into the woods. So if those two sightings suggest that there are reports from the Tejone Pass, going further north, we have the Tehachapi Pass, which also has its reports. In 2010, two young men were hiking near the town of Tehachapi, and one of them lost their prescription sunglasses on the hike. So they both spread out to look for these sunglasses. And it was during this search that one of them stumbled upon a large bare footprint. The track itself was over a foot in length and it had five toes. They mentioned that they found tracks before and after it, but the one that they found was the most clear. The stride between these fainter tracks and this main track was about three feet in length. It also left an indentation of about a quarter inch into the desert soil, which Desert soil, for the most part, is really hard packed. So for whatever this was to make an indent in it was incredibly strong and incredibly heavy. There are no photographs of the tracks, unfortunately. However, it was investigated by the BFRO and they thought both of these gentlemen were telling the truth. And obviously, if you go north from the Tehachapi Pass, that brings you into the Southern Sierras which is where I traveled with Matt Moneymaker late last year to investigate some possible howls that were reported back in the 1940s. So we were on this trip up here in the southern end of the Sierras on the eastern side along the flank that the Pacific Crest Trail goes through because there's been a number of reports over the years of either track finds or sightings or vocalizations on different parts of the Pacific Crest Trail. And that's going not just through here, but all throughout Southern California and then all the way north, literally all the way up to Canada. When we were doing the, the Finding Bigfoot series, several times when we were just following reports, we'd end up being on some part of the Pacific Crest Trail. So between that and all the anecdotal information we've collected over the years, there seems to be a correlation there. So Matt invited me on this trip. It was a BFRO expedition. I had never been on a BFRO expedition before, but it was honestly a fun experience being able to travel along with people who don't look for Sasquatch all the time. Part of the reason that we went when we did was because it was just the beginning of winter. Matt was specifically looking for the first snow of the year, which causes all the deer to move down out of the higher slopes into the lower valleys towards the desert. And if Sasquatch follows the deer, they're gonna go into those lower slopes as well. And then the question for us is, okay, since there's a lot of reports and sightings, etc., good credible information indicating incidents in the summertime in the high mountain ranges, Southern Sierra, and then San Bernardino's, et cetera, down in the Southern. Then where do they go in the winter when the snows hit those mountains and everything else is gonna to wanna to get out of them? You can't just look up online to figure out like the where the animal corridors go out of the mountains. You li really have to just find out from locals. And really what you're hearing is then their best guesses based on what they've seen or where the most deer are, or just their kind of local knowledge. Okay. We're gonna go drive to a potential area, kind of night recon. The first night out, our goal was to find an area that was a little bit higher up, overlooking a valley, to do howls in. The concept behind that is if you do a howl in a high up area, the sound will travel further, and the chances of you hearing something are also higher. If we were lucky, something would howl back. And then, if something howled back, we would head deeper into the valley and employ different tactics in order to draw this creature out or to get us closer to it. Essentially, what we were trying to do was zero in on a location where these creatures might be. What I know from other places is, is they want to follow the herd, so you figure out what the deer herds are going to do. And are the deer herds going to basically, as soon as they get out of the snow, if they're out of the snow level, then when they're in a level of rain, and they're just below the snow, mm -hmm. that's what we think in their lives. They'll stay basically in the same area most of their lives, and then at some point they'll go for a long, long way. Mm -hmm. 
And when they do that, very often they're following the course of one of these big long trails, like Continental Divide Trail. There's all these sightings along the Continental Divide Trail and PCT and Appalachian Trail and Florida Trail and Buckeye Trail. It's like they figure out. Because you're like you're saying they were they were game trails long before it became the hiking trail. Well, it's I don't know in some of those cases maybe, but I think what they had noticed is people backpacking. They saw people going along those trails and they just kind of figured that those trails would go for a long way. Ah, wow. And they would go through green belts where, you know, and they avoid towns. We were traveling up this road heading into higher elevation and uh, it was all completely covered in snow. The snow plows hadn't been through yet and we were finding all kinds of tracks leading through the snow. This is, stop, 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 yeah, stop. Right. you see this? Yeah. Okay, something like, to check out here. Those look like something, don't they? Jumping rabbit, just just leaping rabbit. Some of them seemingly very Sasquatch-like until further examination proved it, that it was other stuff, including bighorn sheep and uh, mountain goats or deer or things like that. We got more tracks crossing the road. They're... Oh shit. Whoa. No. No? What are we it's looking at? It's a hoof. It's a hoof. It's a hoof. So deer? Yeah. Oh yeah, I see the hoof print now. Yeah, it's the wow. The post hole. Yeah, I see it. Wow. Yeah, so. Some of them kind of have an hourglass shape. You they know? did, so when I came up at an angle, I'm like, yeah, yeah, and I got close and I see the, the pole point. So, yeah, it's a big ungulate. It's either a deer or a... Hood off so we can hear better, but it's cold. So PCT goes at the base of that mountain right there. This is the corridor. And believe me, walking along those hillsides, it's just bold. So it ain't gonna walk the ridges here. It's gonna come along the valley. They are not in a pack. Let's see if anything reacts to them. I want to address the topic of a location being blown out, meaning that people have hit a location so many times and have done so many knocks, so many howls, that it has absolutely no effect on the Sasquatch in that area. Talking with different researchers, there seems to be a sort of consensus that that can actually happen to where they just won't react to that anymore because they know it's a trick. Talking to Matt about it, about this particular area and it possibly being blown out, 
it hasn't really been researched in modern times. The last people in this area doing any sort of squatching was back in the 1970s when Rich Grumley was there, and I don't know if they were doing knocks or howls back then. So for all intents and purposes, this area that we were investigating seemed as good as any to try howls. Unfortunately, in the first night, we didn't get any activity, which is unfortunately what happens like 95% of the time you go out there. It's cold. <laughs> it was below 20s quite often during this trip. It was a very, very cold and Although I was prepared, I wasn't exactly expecting that. The tent, I got partially covered in a tarp to help keep in the heat. Hopefully, I don't freeze to death. Well, I may be calling it a night. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, think I'm on that wavelength. Yeah. All right, fellers. Yeah, see you in the morning, man. Yeah, Matt just <laughs> went to sleep in your car. Yeah, he wants to sleep there. <laughs> At least for now, but <laughs> <laughs> nice and warm and cozy. You know? <laughs> my tent was actually very warm. Oh, I need my glasses before I forget those. I actually didn't want to get out of bed because I was so warm and comfy in there. Now it's cold out here. Not as cold as it was last night. Got the sun to warm things up, but I think it's going to be a rough, like, two nights well when i'm not in the tent it's gonna be rough good morning how'd you sleep around up under oak tree and then not, not really great how about you i actually oh. slept really well you stayed warm huh and, yeah i did back to bill and what the I, hell? I may have read that I no i read this on the newspaper the older you get the harder to stay work. warmer i like it. my I 50s now i struggle how'd you sleep very, I did. Oh, well, I, I did a little bit, but uh, it was mostly the most miserable night I've ever had. I think. Oh, bummer. Oh, I was, I was so damn cold. I mean, I, I did the stuff a sleeping bag into another one, and I had a down cover, a comforter over the top, wow. this thing on, and bundled up, and I just could not stay warm. Oh, and uh, it was, you know, finally at about like five-ish this morning, um, I heard footsteps and I go, well, either that's a squatch or it's a, or it's a, what's his face going over to his truck and yeah. that's what it was. And I go, you know what, it's a good idea. Yeah. So I, I just, man, I can't do that again. I'm gonna probably sleep in my car tonight. It was just so cold. When I got in my car this morning and started it up, it was 18 degrees. <laughs> Holy smokes. Oh, Trader Joe's. That's crazy. How'd you sleep, Matt? Not good. I should have brought up the air mattresses and inflated them. Oh. I almost so I was on the hard ground all night. <laughs> oh, no kidding. No. Before I go to bed, I'll make sure to... I brought like three air mattresses not knowing which ones leaked. Fill them all up. <laughs> see which Hedge one... Your bets. Which one goes flat. Yeah. <laughs> on the second day, we headed to a location that Matt had located on 3D topographical maps. Essentially, what Matt was looking for was a choke point. Essentially, where the stream flows into a sort of small canyon with a steep slope on one side and a sort of flatter slope on the other side that allows the deer and things to move through. Matt's kind of theory as to how they hunt is that they stay up on these ridges and look down below them. And if they see their prey, they'll run down these steep slopes, attack the animal, and drag them back up these steep slopes. So the first thing that we have to want to establish with people and that isn't obvious is, if you think you see one, don't point at it. Don't point at anything. Don't use the pointing arm gesture because they can understand that. And if, you know, they would see if you're pointing at them uh, and it would make them hide if they saw that, just like with you. If you're looking at people and you're trying to check them out, if you saw one of them pointing in your direction, you'd be like, oh my God, you know. So they, that's what we do with them and it's the opposite of what. So if you're spying them, what you should be seeing, uh, the Bigfoot should be seeing is people who don't care. 
about what's over that way, what's over that way, what's over that way. They're just hanging out with each other. They could care less about what's going on around them. Since the side we're trying to get to is the left side, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure oh. it's that hill, let's go through the willows and get up, and hopefully we're not gonna have to cross water and get to the other side and flank along there. And obviously, we weren't able to drive to this location, so we decided to hike to it. When we got closer to that location, we found that not only had we hiked really far, but we still had a ways to go. So me and another person there, Lauren, hiked up the hill a little bit to see whether it was worth checking out or not. This looks easier once you get to it. It's pretty easy. The boulders help. <sighs> God, he's so fast. He's way too fast for me. Holy crap. There's, just a, there's another hill as you continue on, so this is kind of like a false summit we're at. Not really. We gotta get up. To, we gotta get up. To, we gotta get up to another rock, probably, to be able to get the killer view, which we could maybe do. I'll see how tough it is to get over to that rock. Copy that. So yeah, we were hoping that this side of the mountain of this hill, which is steep and rocky, would create a pinch point where the river is create a pinch point so that the squatches could be up here come down for water and or ambush deer or anything that's grazing on the other side you turn around Eli we're heading back all right so this spot right here there's still another summit about another hundred feet up so you have to kind of go down and then up another rise dang and uh, there's some people that are just not going to want to do that, especially in the dark. But uh, yeah, and even maybe not tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, even this is a little sketchy. Like you could definitely get hurt bad. Oh yeah, it's dude! I almost in. slipped over there. Did you? Yeah. So I don't know. But the problem is the snow makes it all slick. Yeah. Things that we did on this trip was actually used my drone for reconnaissance, if you want to call it that. But basically. I took my drone up to kind of survey the lay of the land and after hiking had exhausted us, took the drone up, flew it around the hill and found out that what we were looking at wasn't what we were looking for. The choke point itself wasn't much of a choke point as it was much too wide and you know, that's not a choke point. So with the hike having exhausted us, and it not being what we were looking for, we decided to head back. So there's coyotes over this way going off, a pack of them, and there's another pack <clears throat> at least, and maybe something beyond that, but at least one more pack a mile up. Wow. Did you hear those wolves going off? Yeah. That's a, 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 a whatchamacallit, a captive wolf. Though. Yeah. So the wolf and then the coyotes went off, and now we got an answer from further up. Yeah, we need to go to that first howling spot we were at last night. Follow it. 
Let's try to see how far down we can go. something right before these guys got started too similar these are the ones we heard the other night because we we're very close to where that was yeah there's a dog I wonder what that little scream was. I didn't hear it, but maybe I picked it up. Yeah, Susie had heard it before. Yeah, before his second, right before he called the second time, I heard it, and then like, I, Mike turned around and looked. He must have, Mike, did you hear that? What? Did you hear that little scream out there? I did not. Okay, because you turned just as it, went off so I thought you heard it I heard oh. it yeah so I probably didn't hear it because I was crunching in the snow probably <laughs> whatever Matt and Susie were hearing behind these coyote howls seemed to elude us and there was only so much we could do you know what I'm thinking we may it may just be as good a shot here as back at our campground even though it's not in the main channel of the creek, I, I do think if, if it, they do come through, they're going to be loud. And when they're, I think we would hear them from over there. But I don't think it's any use staying here longer. Yeah, that scream, I don't know, but they're... <laughs> if that is one, it, it's not wanting to vocalize more. Good morning, Mike. Hi there. Lauren. Lauren Eli. That's good. Between good morning, us. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Slept in my car last night, and it was the best sleep I had in three nights. Really? Yeah, nice and warm. I only had to turn the engine on about three or four times, and uh, oh. when you get home, you'll probably just park in the parking lot and just rock. <laughs> yeah. The next day, we headed deeper into the mountains, into a different area than we had searched before. This road was a lot rougher than the roads we have been traveling on, but seemed to be a lot more promising as it opened up to a lot more valleys than we had access to in the area that we were camping in. Okay, so we're heading out on the road looking for possibly another area to do howls tonight. We realized the PCT connects uh, further down the mountain than we thought. Lower elevation, less snow, 
We think the Squatches might have headed down from where we are, down to this area, just to get out of the snow. And but this is the pathway if you're gonna go south out of these mountains. Okay, second spot, second howling spot. And interestingly enough, while exploring the area, we found a valley that ended and went straight into the desert of Inyokern, which maybe supports the idea of Sasquatch traveling into deserts? I don't know. Let's all go hang out on the rock, man. I'm going up. It's pretty insane. I can't even keep my poncho on. Yeah. It's certainly an easy path, but on top of that, from where we were, still in the mountains, we could see across the desert of Inyokern and into different mountains. Which, and this is a lot of speculation, but if Sasquatch can determine, can look across these expanses, they might be able to see when mountains are greener, suggesting more water, and therefore decide that it's worth the gamble of crossing the desert to get to those other mountain ranges to get access to water and food. Okay, it's the final night. We're heading back up to the area that we scoped out today. Like I said earlier, it's lower down the mountain, but it still follows the PCT. And we think that the Squatches trying to get out of the snow have migrated down there in order to just stay out of the snow, stay warmer. Um, other animals will have migrated down further than that as well. So we're hoping that when we do some howls or something through those canyons that we might get a response. It's been nothing but coyotes on this trip. Hopefully tonight we get a little bit of Squatch action. So off in this direction we're in the Sierras and we're looking at mountain ridge after mountain ridge after mountain ridge and it's all wilderness area with no roads and no humans and the idea is the upper areas got their first snowstorm uh, just a few days ago and so we're thinking that all that stuff is migrating down slope and there's basically two pathways out of here the one we just passed and this one and a local guy basically tipped us off and says there's a very spooky you know part of this valley where uh, no people ever go to and it's got a lot of ledges and views and acoustical vantage points and he strongly recommended we go check it out and from past experience uh i can tell you when you get a tip like that from a local very often it's a very productive tip and it's not like they're trying to send you somewhere where their friend's going to fake you out, but it's <clears throat> it's their deepest intuition tells them from everything they've heard in the past that if something like this were going to be around, then that's where it's going to be. For the sound to go all the way down to that valley and echo around, the air has to be <clears throat> not only cold, but perfectly just very, very still, very still and quiet. When it's windy and turbulent like that, that it's <clears throat> it's a uh, it's something that's not talked about how how uh, different air conditions, atmospheric conditions, totally affect the distance that sounds are going to be audible. But uh, yeah, nothing down in the valley is going to hear us with this wind blowing. Yeah, so we'll go down there, and there's a, there's a campground down there, and I know we have to go beyond that. I do want to wait a minute because we were just 
making car engine noise and door slamming so but there's no wind here okay so what I'm gonna try to do is bounce sound off that mountain <clears throat> Because if I could bounce it off the mountain, then I know it's going down the canyon. forward and stop again. About a thousand feet. Alright. Don't slam doors too hard. Don't slam the doors too hard. Don't slam the doors too hard. Wow, look at this. Not even any coyotes. No, that's what I was thinking. But you know, you it took you like three times before they started going near our camps. Yeah. So. Well, I'll do it a couple times. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna go another mile and do it again. I mean. What, what do you think you're trying to communicate? Are you, are you, is well, it almost like... like if, they were, if they were to hear it from a distance, which is the most likely possibility, they'd hear kind of a muffled, echoey... Yeah. Uh, and if it's... If, if they know it's not a coyote, their lifestyle, they're so spread out, so sparsely populated, that when they hear another one, they are absolutely compelled. It's really important for them to be able to connect with other ones. Yeah. And respond to them. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like saying, "What's the likelihood of somebody ringing your doorbell, knocking at the door that you're just you're not going to answer the door?" Well, yeah. you might, but usually you're going to answer the door. It makes sense. So this is us knocking on the door. Yeah. <clears throat> we tried a lot of different spots along that road, howling into different canyons. Unfortunately, nothing howled back. And again, that's just the way it goes most of the time when you're out Bigfooting. Nothing happens. These are incredibly elusive animals that are difficult to find. So it was the end of the expedition and everyone had started going home. Matt and I stayed behind so we could do his interview and we were sitting there getting a bite to eat and someone recognized Matt from finding Bigfoot. He was like this 19 year old guy and he was like, I was literally just talking about how finding Bigfoot's the best show on the way here and now you're here. And he was starstruck. However, he was a local kid and he knew the area better than any of us. And so Matt started to ask this kid questions and it turns out he was a hunter and knew a place that Matt was searching for, a sort of choke point area. But not only that, it was a location that all the local hunters, including the Native American hunters, did not like to be in at night. Why that is? No one really had a definite answer, but no one stayed there overnight. And I find that highly fascinating, and so did Matt. So we got the location from this guy, and we headed out to that spot. All right, so Matt and I found the spot that the locals told us about, but we, we don't want to risk coming through because the snow's a little bit too deep for my rental car. So we're going to come back 
One day, we're gonna come back with a higher clearance vehicle and cut through into the promised land of the Squatches. Look at that. That's, that's where they're gonna be. That's where they're at. I mean, this place was exactly what we were looking for. A choke point with a source of water in a lower elevation where there's less snow. However, looking at everything, I think there is a strong case to be made for a Sasquatch migration route through the mountains of Southern California. Obviously, places like the Sierra are a lot more bountiful than places here in Southern California, but I don't think that rules out the possibility of them being here. In the previous episode, I established that there is a historical record of them being as far south as Palomar Mountain, and there's reports of them being even further south than that that I'll explore in the future. But I really do think that they use the passes between these mountain ranges to get from mountain range to mountain range in search of food, just like all the other animals. I don't think they can stay in one spot out here. Stay tuned for more Southern California episodes because I plan on delving into this topic quite extensively. But with that, that's about it for this episode, and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks. Until next time.